Hello, this is Mark Tooley, president of the Institute on Religion and Democracy. And today I have the pleasure of speaking with uh, Dr. Samuel Goldman, political scientist at George Washington University, head of the Loeb Institute for Religious Freedom, and author of a recent book on uh, Christian Zionism in America. And uh, Sam is going to uh, speak to us about uh, the events that have unfolded across America since the unfortunate uh, happening in Minneapolis. So uh, Sam, thanks so much uh, for talking to us. Thanks for having me, Mark. Well, Sam, uh, off the top of your head, uh, what is your analysis in terms of what's happening to America uh, politically, spiritually, since uh, the unfortunate and very tragic uh, killing of the man in Minneapolis by the police officer? Well, the events of recent days remind me of an idea developed by the political scientist Samuel Huntington uh, in his book from the early 80s, uh, American Politics, The Promise of Disharmony, um, which is a somewhat forgotten classic in my view. It receives much less attention than his later and more controversial works on the clash of civilization uh, and American national identity, but I think um, the Promise of Disharmony is, is really his greatest contribution. Um, and in this book, Huntington argues that American history is characterized by moments of what he calls creedal passion, when different aspects of the American creed, which is his way of describing the loose set of principles, values, and institutions that characterize the American political tradition are pitted against each other in some way. So liberty may be pitted against equality. Um, justice as an outcome may be pitted against due process. And in Huntington's view, most of the great crises of American politics over the last 250 years have been the moments in which elements of the creed come into conflict. And it seems to me that we are in um, another one of these moments today. Well, uh, and so what are some of the other crises uh, comparable to uh, today? The assassination of Martin Luther King obviously would be one. Well, uh, the assassination of Martin Luther King, but I, I think that was only an element of the broader crisis of legitimacy in the late 1960s, which included the civil rights movement in um, its later and increasingly radical phases, but also disillusionment um, about the war in Vietnam. Um, and just like uh, the disorder um, and, and public resistance, we are seeing now um, in the late 1960s, it wasn't about just one issue. There wasn't just one cause. Rather, there were events, including the assassination of King, that triggered anger, frustration, and disappointment about many aspects of American life. And so with the killing of uh, George Floyd in uh, Minneapolis, uh, what elements of the American creed are directly in conflict with each other right now? Well, I, I think we see very clearly um, a tension between the American principle of equal justice um, and a comparable or even equally strong commitment to the rule of law. Um, on the one hand, and I think the polls bear this out, majorities of Americans are sympathetic to the cause of the protesters and are horrified um, by the circumstances of George Floyd's death. Um, on the other hand, um, most Americans are very much opposed to rioting, looting, and disorder. And according to uh, the Morning Consult poll released yesterday, would even favor um, uh, deploying the military to restore order. So the challenge is how to reconcile those demands. Um, how, how can we um, secure justice um, and particularly justice in the sort of systematic or, 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 or comprehensive sense um, that the protesters have uh, demanded um, while also maintaining civic order and the authority of public institutions. Now, obviously, uh, the American creed is central to American civil religion, 
I've uh, compared the current um, unrest and controversy to uh, America's uh, long history of um, Puritan guilt and revivalism, a cycle of um, repentance and uh, exaltation followed by guilt and a new cycle. Uh, would you make that same connection? I think that's right. And I've, I've suggested that in a slightly different context um, in a piece that I wrote for the American Mind website um, on the rise of the new campus left, um, which I think in many ways prefigures uh, the recent events. Um, on the one hand, I think that's exactly right, that Americans have repeated a sort of cycle of guilt and repentance that goes back to the Puritans. And of course, the, the Jeremiah or, or self-accusation is, is a central part of American literary traditions as well as political ones. What's different now, I think, is that we have lost the connections to the religious ideas and sources and institutions that made that tradition continuous. Um, so when uh, King spoke in this register, for example, he was speaking very much as a Christian um, who was influenced not only by the Bible, but by developments in theology um, continuing until his own education after World War II. Um, now what we seem to see is a sort of religious impulse without a religious vocabulary or a religious framework. Um, and I think that is a loss even for those of us who are not religious believers because the Christian and Hebraic traditions <clears throat> on which this cycle has drawn are really ancient meditations extending back thousands of years on precisely these questions. The balance of right and wrong, justice and order, the responsibility of nations, the meaning of repentance and, and collective obligation. Um, and we can learn from them even without believing literally in their divine origin. Now we really have no way or, of talking about these things. Um, or no way of talking about them that doesn't seem, at least to me, fundamentally trivializing. Um, and I just saw earlier today on Twitter, um, uh, the journalist Matt Iglesias um, uh, suggested uh, correctly that there's nothing new about a demand for collective repentance. In, in American political life, very much as you're, as you're suggesting. And he even uh, has introduced the term, the great awakening to describe mm. uh, the present moment. Um, but the, the evidence he provided for that claim was Lincoln's second inaugural. And I don't think that you can read the second inaugural and not be struck immediately by the contrast between the profound moral and theological pathos of Lincoln's words drawing on uh, the Hebrew Bible in particular and the, the frivolity um, and, and uh, insignificance of much of the rhetoric um, that uh, we here on television or find on social media. Um, I should mention that uh, you and the Loeb Institute for Religious Freedom have co-hosted with IRD several years ago a conference on the political theology of Martin Luther King, which you've just uh, referenced. And of course, uh, King's uh, political theology, as you described, did offer this a uh, pathway to, uh, or suggest a pathway at least for uh, national redemption and atonement. So I think I hear you saying that today uh, America still uh, has the guilt and still is struggling to repent, but isn't really aware of uh, the tools for uh, the atonement process. Uh, is that generally accurate? Yeah, no, I think, I think, that, I think that's, that's, that's right. Um, and there's a photo that's been circulating um, on social media um, this morning and perhaps before I saw um, that that depicted um, a group of uh, 
white protesters kneeling um, before their, their black comrades. Um, and this is as, as obvious and basic a, a religious gesture as one can imagine. Um, and yet it does not seem to be connected to any of these broader structures of thought and practice that might help make sense of it and make, make, make more of it than a symbolic gesture that goes viral um, and might, might have some lasting benefit. It seems to me that uh, the mainline churches were the uh, primary uh, priest of American civil religion and who for so long offered the tools of this uh, pathway or uh, this cycle of uh, guilt, uh, repentance, uh, atonement and uh, with the collapse of uh, the mainline churches and basically they're transitioning into a, a sort of a post-Protestant uh, secularism. Um, you have the evangelicals and you have the Catholics, but they just don't have the same uh, history or the same background in terms of the, being the priest for American civil religion. Do you think that's accurate? I think that, I think that's exactly right. Um, I think the, the mainline churches as, as they became known um, after World War II, even though they have much um, longer <clears throat> histories provided the kind of theological and political balance um, that steadied the the ship of state, so to speak, um, and they could do that um, partly for sociological reasons, but also partly for um, theological and institutional uh, reasons. These, these were really um, religious communities that had made America and grown up with it and were very deeply integrated and, and committed um, with many of uh, its best features, although also some of its worst, it must be, it must be admitted. Um, and in the absence of that ballast, we rock violently back and forth um, in a way that I, I hope will continue without leading to capsize, but may not be um, may not be sustainable. And I, I think I think it's important to say that the great strength of the mainline churches was also one of their greatest weaknesses, because in providing this civic stabilizing function, it really is true, as many of their critics pointed out, that they diverged from a purely religious mission and sort of religious demands that might be um, in tension with the expectations of, of American life. So that criticism had, had some justice to it. On the other hand, it was precisely because they were flexible and not too alien that they were able to serve this, this steadying function. This uh, impulse in American history to go through this cycle of uh, national guilt, repentance, and struggling for atonement, uh, is this completely unique to America because of its uh, Puritan and revivalistic background? Or do other nations have a, a similar experience in their own traditions? I don't think it's unique to America. What I think is distinctively American is that it's continued so long. Um, so in um, other, other nations, especially Protestant nations, um, many of the same influences and, and tendencies are present. And there are, there are moments that are comparable. The difference, I think, is that most of Europe left all of that behind in the 19th century, or certainly after World War I, um, and was much more thoroughly secularized in the 20th century. Um, in, in America, that heritage is still with us in powerful ways that we don't always perceive. And that, that I think is distinctive, if not entirely unique. Certainly uh, France, for example, still struggles with the legacy of its uh, collaboration during World War II. And obviously Germany has its own dark history to struggle with. Uh, they have the guilt, uh, but uh, do they not also struggle with some form of uh, national uh, atonement and reconciliation or what cycles do they go through in that process? 
Well, I know I know less about um, about France, so I'll leave that uh, out of the consideration out of consideration. I, I know more um, about Germany um, and what has developed in Germany, um, partly as a result of the process of secularization that I've described, um, is a kind of ersatz religion of atonement. Um, atonement in particular for the, the Shoah, but really for the whole first half of, of, the, 20th, of the 20th century. Um, and it has many of the defects that I've been describing in the Great Awakening, as Iglesias has, has called it, in that it, it reflects or draws on what seems to be a genuine religious impulse but at least in its most public expressions, lacks the vocabulary or moral depth really to manifest and apply that, that uh, impulse. Um, mm -hmm. And as a result, it has a tendency to uh, degenerate into um, empty gesture politics um, or a kind of moralistic kitsch. Sam, I uh, think you identify yourself as uh, non-religious, uh, but you have more knowledge about American religion than most religious Americans do. Uh, as a, an observer of American religion, uh, do you see emerging uh, from this uh, current national agony a uh, potential religious revival based on uh, past cycles, or is it just too early to even uh, make such a prediction? I, I, I hesitate to make to make predictions, but certainly um, it has been true in the past, and Huntington makes this point when he discusses these moments of, of creedal passion, um, that a crisis of American national identity and moral and political consciousness has produced a kind of religious awakening. Um, and, and as I say, there's some evidence that that actually is happening. The question is how much it will look like previous religious awakenings and to what extent it will take this secularized, or as you've said, probably even, even more correctly, this post-Protestant form that retains religious impulses and, and structures, but I think to a considerable degree, hollows them out of their, of their content. Sam Goldman, uh, Professor of Political Science at George Washington University, uh, thank you so much uh, for an, as always, uh, fascinating and intriguing conversation. It's been a pleasure, Mark, thank you.